Um, I'm not going to give a lengthy introduction to Heather Ann Thompson because you have a lengthy introduction to Heather Ann Thompson in your materials. So if you haven't already done so, I just invite you at some point to look at her credentials. She is a professor at Temple University. No. Yes. Good. Uh, she has... A, I was going to say, I was going to say UPenn, and it's like, no, she's definitely a temple, but she is moving to the University of Michigan this fall. She's a professor of uh, a, a joint appointment in the Department of Africana Studies, African American Studies, and History. And one of the things that I think it's important for friends to understand is as important as Michelle's message was, particularly energetically and and incisive in its insights um, into how we got to where we are. There is a history of how people of color, in particular African American people, have had a criminal, it has been associated with skin pigment for a great deal longer than just the kind of snapshots that we get in the media. From, and so it's a long history, so we really have to know a little bit about the fuller range of where, where we are in order to recognize the magnitude of what we're up against in a white supremacist system that has existed in the country since we brought white people as colonizers. So I'm not going to say a lot more, but I, I would recommend that you go to the website that I've cited for her and read the articles that she's written. Um, all of them have been very informative to me. So thank you so thank much you. for being with us, Heather Ann. Thank you so much for having me. And really, thank you all for coming back from lunch. And, and um, uh, it was an honor for me this morning to be able to hear Michelle along with you. And what I hope now to do is to add to that discussion more than anything else. Uh, this is a presentation that I have given uh, literally, uh, I don't know, hundreds of times around the country this year, but also globally because the international community is really interested in what's happening in this country, uh, in part because uh, private prison companies are so eager now to export what we do to other countries. And so I, I, I kind of designed this talk as a way, uh, by, by training I'm a historian, but also an activist and an advocate, and I designed this talk as a way to get us to all think about really, first of all, how we got here so that we can understand the magnitude of what we face so that then we can then figure out how we might change it. Uh, because one of the things my training as a historian has given me is a real sense not just of what's wrong with this country, but also the, uh, the ways in which what is wrong has been changed. And one thing is for sure that every important change in this country has come about because numerous groups of people, numerous coalitions have formed because they have begun to see why this matters to them, to their community, uh, to the people who they are closest to. So the talk that I have today is really about, it's picking up on Michelle's idea that uh, mass incarceration uh, is indeed the civil rights crisis of the 21st century. And, and in, in that configuration, what does that look like? How did it become so? And how might we change it? Um, let me just first say, I think it might be obvious to many of us why it's a civil rights crisis of the century. But I want to hopefully give you some examples and some information and some language that we can all use in our own communities to really impress upon people why that's true. And one of the first things I would always say is that one of the reasons why mass incarceration is the not one of, the civil rights crisis of the 21st century, is because it takes all other civil rights issues and makes them much, much more acute. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about poverty, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about educational disparities, it doesn't matter if we're talking about housing inequality, no matter what we are talking about, mass incarceration becomes a common denominator that makes all things much, much more severe. And therefore, it's a very useful way of not just changing one very important thing in our society, but actually impacting on uh, many, many more all at the same time. So to get this conversation started, I want to actually just begin back at the beginning. I always think it's helpful. We, we all, many of us know all this, but it's important to kind of remind ourselves what we're talking about. We're talking about a mass incarceration, but we are really talking about a massive carceral state. This graph will hopefully give you a sense of how massive this is. Each slice of the pie, you'll notice only half of it is state prisons. 
The rest of it shows you the kind of scope of what we're talking about, immigration detention centers, juvenile detention centers, and goes on and on and on, right? And so this is a massive, massive problem. One, by the way, that is not just, uh, not just new. Indeed, it's historically unprecedented. We've never, ever seen anything like this in the history of our nation, but also internationally unparalleled. I'm sure you've heard this before. This is us compared to all other democratic uh, Western democracies. Uh, and, and we do very poorly. And it wouldn't matter actually who we put ourselves up against on this graph. We could put South Africa. We could put Rwanda. We could put... Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter what we put up here, we would still be by far the international outlier. So we're talking um, by 2011 about over 2 million people being locked in uh, facilities, but over 7.5 million people under some form of correctional control. In Pennsylvania, where we are today, by 2011, we're talking about almost 51, actually 52,000 people locked up and another 350,000 people under correctional control in this state alone where you sit today. So this is a crisis that didn't just happen overnight, it took time. And over time, it began to take funding from one place to another. This is just an example of one place it took funding from, this would be mental uh, facilities. Um, but we could look at schools, we could look at all kinds of other things. And what I wanna suggest to you is that this is not just any crisis. Of course, we know this because we've been listening closely to Michelle and reading her book. This is, and of course, experientially, we know that this is a, a crisis particularly for black and brown people. Uh, we talk a lot about how it's particularly a crisis for men, which it absolutely is. We have uh, horrific statistics for young African-American men. But I also want to point out it's also a horrific situation for women of color too. Just like the police violence is uh, a serious crisis for black men, it's also a very serious crisis for black women. And indeed, this crisis that we're talking about because it is a civil rights crisis, we have to look at the first question that in people in many communities are gonna say, well, it's kind of ugly, I agree with you, but isn't it true, mm, mm, dirty secret, isn't it true maybe that those black and brown people commit more crimes than white people? Maybe this is where the real policing needs to be. And the answer is, and this is why I always start with this wherever I talk, an unequivocal, no. And these two graphs are particularly powerful because this is just talking about the drug war. I chose this because this is where we were this morning talking a lot. Um, but if you look at not only just who uses drugs, but who are arrested for drugs, but also who's selling drugs, the data is crystal, crystal clear. We do not police where we police because we have to. We police where we police because we choose to. So why does this matter? Why indeed does mass incarceration matter? Well, I want to suggest to you that it matters because in fact, it completely changes our cities, our economy, and actually our very democracy. And if we can work through those things, just and I'll try to do it as quickly as I can, some of this will be obvious, some of this might be news to you, but either way, what I hope to persuade us is there's so many ways in which we can intersect with this issue. There's so many ways in which we can bring people on board to talk about this issue, whether they may be doctors, they may be teachers, they may be running the local PT, it doesn't matter. This affects everybody, or at least I'm hoping to persuade you. The first thing I wanna talk about is the way in which mass incarceration has really affected the fate of our cities. Um, and, and the way I wanna talk about this first is to point out that people always talk about cities as, you know, something terrible happened after the 80s. You know, cities just go to hell in a handbasket. They used to be these great places. We all wanted to live downtown. We all wanted, and then we, everybody went to the suburbs who could, and people who couldn't, well, I'm sorry for you that you couldn't leave. Well, what happened to cities? Well, we have a lot of stories about what happened to cities, most of them true, right? We get deindustrialization, we get job loss, we get white flight, we get all kinds of horrible things that happens to cities. But the big elephant in the room that happens in cities after 1965, and that's a much earlier date than you'll usually hear, is mass incarceration. This is the elephant in the room that has completely destroyed cities in a way that we have not talked about. The way it does has done it is through a process that I call the criminalization of urban space. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that in just a moment, give some, flesh that out. But first I wanna ask you a much more important question because this is what you're gonna get asked a lot. Why did we start this war on crime when we did? Why did we go down this horrendous path? Because that's right up there with, mm, who is really committing the crimes, right? Well, popular lore has it. We started the war on crime, face it, 
because we had a serious crime problem. It was the 1960s, things were all out of control, everybody was shooting up, everybody was robbing each other, it was a complete nightmare, we needed to start the war on crime. Well, the fact of the matter is that that is inaccurate. Lyndon Johnson actually started the war on crime, not Richard Nixon. He started the war on crime in 1964 when he started something called the Law Enforcement Administration Act. That gave us the apparatus, the huge apparatus that would make the war on crime possible. But here's what you should know about 1964. Look at this graph. The murder rate in 1965 had not been that low since the 19-teens. And in fact, it had been much higher at other points and we had not responded to it with a massive war on crime. And the reason why this is important is because what that zeroes in on is the fact that we started the war on crime as a policy choice, not as a safety imperative. That means, of course, it's very important because it means that if we chose it, we can unchoose it. This is again stating the obvious, but I think it's important to point this out. Not just the homicide rate, but you notice something about the violent crime rate. Things get a whole lot less safe the more we wage the war on crime. And in fact, the violent crime rate skyrockets at the height, the very zenith of the drug war. And that's also some important information. So then why do we do this? Well, the answer is complicated, but one of the reasons that we do this is because after 1965, something pretty profound happened in this country. And that was that the civil rights movement that had been in the South pretty much uh, bubbling away it was easy when it was in the South. You could be a Northern politician and say, you know, yeah, those crackers down there, those racist, really, you know, absolutely. Send in the federal troops, gotta knock some heads. We gotta uphold the law in Selma, in Birmingham. But all of a sudden, when it was Philadelphia in 1964 and Rochester or Boston or Harlem, all of a sudden Northern politicians, in particular the Johnson administration, but we could name many, many more names, begin to do exactly what Strom Thurmond had been doing for years and Sheriff Bull Connor had been doing for years, which is he began to equate civil rights unrest with criminality. We can trace it out, we can look at the language, and by 1964, Johnson is talking about this plague of crime in our cities and how we must do something about it. You should know that we've been here before, and this is important because being here before means we can learn some lessons about how we got out of it the first time. Right after the Civil War, we had another civil rights rebellion. It wasn't the civil rights 1960s, it was the civil rights 1860s. And we had four million newly freed African Americans that wanted a real voice in the polity, a real opportunity for jobs. And white Southerners responded to that in 1865 by doing one thing, criminalizing all black spaces, making things that were not illegal, illegal, making things that had been illegal much more illegal. And overnight, southern towns with large black populations became criminalized towns. And overnight, southern penitentiaries went from all white to all black overnight. The Georgia State Penitentiary, no black folks in it, 98% black by 1890. Not because black folks lose their mind and white folks stop committing crime, because it was a policy choice, a literal policy choice to start a war on crime. So we did this again after the civil rights 60s is one very uh, quick way of thinking about this. And so with this new start of the war on crime in 18, I'm sorry, 18, 1865, 1965, it's all the same. <laughs> we create the apparatus that creates the war on crime. And then you know what happens next. We add to it. We add to it with a massive revolution in drug law, right? You know this story, this is a familiar story. It's a story about basically putting all kinds of people under surveillance and arresting all kinds of people that had previously been largely ignored by the system. Not quite completely ignored, but largely ignored. We know that the drug addiction rate in America has remained remarkably stable, but yet the criminalizations of drugs have changed over time. Anyone ever hear of prohibition, for example? One of the least safe times in American history. One of the times with the highest murder rates in American history, the last time we criminalized behavior. So the drug war is very serious. The drug war across the nation, uh, in one decade you see here from 1990 to 2009, almost an 80% increase in uh, residents under correctional control for drugs. In Philadelphia in 1980, there was about 13, about 14,000 people sentenced for drug offenses in 2007, almost 59,000 people sentenced for drug. Now again, let's be clear, it's not because everybody became a crackhead overnight. 
It had to do with the criminalization of space. Because one of the things you quickly notice about the drug war is that the people who are being pinched most are the people for possession. It's not Noriega we're going after here. We are going after the people who have low levels amounts of drugs in their possession, oftentimes because of addiction, right? So we also begin this process of criminalizing addiction. This is one of the key ways, as Michelle Alexander has shown us, why we get such a racially disproportionate war on drugs. I want to just bring your attention to this graph. If you can't see it, try to stand up and see it. It's really kind of stunning. We know it, but seeing the graphs is kind of shocking. This is a marijuana arrest, possess um, sorry, possession arrests in the 25 most populous counties in the United States. We aren't even in the ballpark of equity when it comes to arrests for marijuana, right? So you very quickly begin to understand how this system is working from the very beginning, okay? So the revolution in drug war. The next thing, of course, that happens is we begin locking up people longer and longer and longer. This has become normal to many generations, right, of children now. It's, it's normal. You know, if you kill someone, you go away for life, you never ever have a chance to redeem to get out. If you have small levels of drugs, you might go away for 20 years. Normal, 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 right? Not normal, not normal internationally, not even normal for us historically. People in Michigan in one decade began doing 80% more time than they'd done the, eight, the decade before for the exact same offenses, right? So it isn't normal. In Philadelphia, of course, you know that this has meant uh, high rates of juvenile life without the possibility of parole. Across the nation, it's meant that. And our Supreme Court said, you know what? Mm, stop. It's inhumane. It's cruel and unusual. You can't lock up children for the rest of their life without the opportunity for parole. But in Pennsylvania and in Michigan, my two main states, prosecutors went to enormous lengths to make sure that that law was not retroactive. And they won. So we have a pretty serious situation on our hands. In, in Pennsylvania, we have more than 500 children uh, serving some form uh, of this sentence, and over 300 of them are from Philadelphia. We're also talking about the criminalization of schools adding to this crisis, right? And this is, and hopefully you'll notice what I'm doing. I'm touching on all kinds of interest areas here. I mean, now we're talking about things that might be of interest to the PTA or to school teachers or whoever. We're talking about the fact that schools became ground zero also for criminalization at Bourbon Space. By 2011, the school district of Philadelphia, for example, boasted a huge security force of about 657 personnel, including 408 police officers and 249 school officers. School districts across the country began forming these alliances, these automatic alliances with prosecution, prosecutors and you know, essentially entire DA offices so that whatever happened in the school automatically got deferred and referred to the DA. This happened across the country. It certainly is happening in Philadelphia. And we know from the data that the minute you get pinched in this system, whether it is even for writing on your desk, that's the end of it, right? Because you're already missing school. You're already in the system. You're already marked in the way that Michelle Alexander is talking about. I bring your attention to this because I want to remind us that this is always and always, always about a morality issue. This is the case some of you might have read recently in the Bronx, the small child. Um, who was essentially accused by a classmate of having stolen $5 on the playground. They had a little scuffle. Turned out there, no one had even $5. And he was locked up here, chained, as you can see, in the police department after being taken away in a squad car. And it was a very long time before his parents even knew where he was, let alone to get him untethered from this wall. Because one of the things about criminalizing urban space is, again, urban space in America, particularly after the white flight of the earlier period, was often and always and most often space of color. I don't have to be a PhD in history to tell anybody in this room, because we've lived it, we've experienced it as families, as teachers, as doctors, as physicians, as anybody, that the fallout from this criminalization of urban space has been catastrophic. When we look at our cities, when we were in North Philadelphia, I don't care where you're from, you know the place in your city where this place is, right? Where you drive by and you think, what in the world happened here, right? It looks like a bomb has gone off. What in the world happened here? Well, what happened here is what we now refer to as million dollar blocks. 
It is the worst possible name because it suggests something that it is not. Million dollar blocks is what it means, how much it costs to lock up everybody on a block. It actually should be called billion dollar blocks because when you lock up everybody on a block and you absolutely erode an entire neighborhood, it costs a lot more than a million dollars. This is Detroit, where I'm from, and I just want to, you know, you might not know enough about Detroit to, to make this significant, but I'll tell you one thing you know about Detroit. It's always the poster child for the city that, that's gone to, you know, hell in a handbasket. This is Detroit, the, the east side of Detroit on the top. This was one of the most vibrant working class, black working class neighborhoods in the 1970s. This is in 2012. You notice that one in 22 adults is under some form of correctional control. One in 22. And if you go to the insert map on the bottom, which is one particular neighborhood on the east side of Detroit, Brewer Park, it is one in 16 people under some form of correctional control. So when we look around Detroit and we say, what happened to Detroit? Yeah, it mattered that the auto plants were in trouble, right? And it mattered that we had white flight, but this mattered a whole lot too, because it literally emptied out entire communities of their grown-ups. So the first fallout that I wanted to call your attention to was the fact that this has absolutely destroyed the infrastructure of neighborhoods, which in turn, of course, has orphaned generations of children. When I say orphaned, I don't mean that in a legalistic sense. I mean that in a very deep, emotional, familiar sense. That is saying taking children outside, removing them from their homes that they lived in, or taking their parents from their homes that they lived in. This is a traumatizing experience. And I want to just share with you, just really quickly, this is a little off script, but just to, just to really drill down on how traumatizing this is at the community level, uh, I heard from a friend of mine, I was at this event in New York City, and she's an attorney, and she was explaining, to her, explaining how she had heard from a, a police official in New York City, they were talking about drug, drug busts. And he said something to the effect of, well, you know, now when we go in, we always bring a sheet. And she said, you know, why do we, why do we bring in a sheet? And he says, well, because, you know, when we're in a drug bust, the first thing we do is we shoot the dog. But that is so traumatizing to the children watching their dog bleed out in front of them that now we know that it's time to bring the sheet so that we cover the dog so that we can get, around with our, get on with our business. So when I'm talking about coalitions, when I'm talking, why isn't PETA talking about this, right? Yeah. I mean, this is an issue that touches everybody. It orphans children. We now know that in most states across this country, uh, when parents are removed from children, if they don't see their children within 15 months or talk to their children or see their children, which of course is almost impossible to do because where are prisons? About as far away from people's families as they could be, they risk losing their parental rights permanently. So when I, in that sense, we are literally talking about a legal orphaning of children. Upwards of 10 million children in this country has been touched by this in some form or fashion. We know that this has also destroyed communities because it creates joblessness and poverty. I don't have to tell you the obvious. If you have a record, you can't get a job, right? There's a box. It makes you check the box. Not sometimes not just have you ever served time, but sometimes have you ever been accused of a crime? And my students always say to me, is that legal? No. Well, guess what? Everything's legal until it's not. That is to say, until it's challenged and until someone says you can't do something, pretty much you can do whatever you want. And so thankfully, this is something that's starting to be challenged, but the fact of the matter is the unemployment rate of people on probation or parole is catastrophic, upwards of 80% in almost any community of incarceration. So what about welfare then? Can they go to get welfare? No, because again, in so many communities, the welfare state and the carceral state have been joined at the hip. So if you have a record, you can't get a job, but you also can't get food stamps, and you also can't get public housing and we scratch our heads and wonder why we have a recidivism rate that we do. Yeah. So when I say this has destroyed communities, we are talking about a major destroying of communities. I wish that were all of it, but again, speaking in the spirit of how can we all get involved, how might it touch all of us, the long reach of the carceral state is much bigger than that community upon which it is preyed, which is what I mostly want to talk about, it's what I mostly am interested in, but it's actually much bigger than that. We have a public health crisis in this country as a result of the carceral crisis. We have high levels of untreated disease coming out of prisons that are so overcrowded. 
and affecting people outside even of prison walls and the families of people of, who have been in prison. For example, in the 1980s, there was an epidemic of TB in New York. Hadn't seen that since the 19th century, and it was traced directly back to Rikers Island. Right now in the state of Texas, there's a real problem with MRSA. You know MRSA in the hospitals, you know the deadly MRSA, right? They trace the strain of the DNA that they're finding in, in MRSA in Texas hospitals directly to the Texas Department of Corrections, to its prisons, because they were treating prisoners with five days of antibiotics. That's like a huge human petri dish, right, of, of basically creating antibiotic resistant strains of, uh, of infection. So this is affecting communities that may think that they have absolutely nothing to do with the prison crisis, or they don't think they know anybody who might be in prison, although as Michelle has said many times, and, and I say also, we also need to do a whole lot more truth talking. The fact of the matter is this actually directly affects all of us if we're just honest about it. Everybody in our family probably knows someone who's been to prison. If you think, well, no, no, I actually know no one in my prison. I guarantee you know someone in your family that's had drug addiction, someone in your family that's had some form of reason that could have landed them in prison, and if they didn't, go for the grace of God because they had some other resource in the family that prevented that eventuality. This didn't just affect our cities, it also affected our economy, just roasting through this really quickly, and again, this had a 19th century corollary. Because after the Civil War, remember, I just said that we criminalized black spaces. Well, we didn't just criminalize them, we didn't just lock everybody up, we also put them to work. We had convict leasing, that's basically how we got Florida, beautiful Florida. That's how we got most southern states, was through the convict leasing, through the abuse of the convict leasing system, through the re-enslavement of people. And guess what? We kind of got rid of that. We can talk about that later in Q&A. How do we get rid of it? But that's about coalition building and movement building. We got rid of convict leasing. And then, while well, the key, key player in that was the labor movement. And then while the labor movement is sadly asleep at the wheel, and we start locking everybody up again, guess who was not asleep at the wheel? Corporations. And they said, oh my God, wow, we got ooh, too, many, too, too many people in prison. And, Wow, this is and seven million people in the system. Man, this is an opportunity. Let's overhaul the laws. And so just like they overhauled the criminal laws in the 1960s, they over, overhauled all of the key regulations against prison labor in 1979. 1979. And the first thing that happens is federal prisons go from being minor to major players in the marketplace. You know all these wars we've been in lately? Remember? Back in time, for some of the people more my, my age in the room, wars used to mean a boom in the economy. You know, munitions, Rosie the Riveter, let's build a few tanks, let's build a few flak checks. No, those jobs are now built by, those, that's federal prison work now. Particularly the body armor, all this stuff is being taken out of the, the, the free world economy, put into the prison economy, okay? Recycling of computers. You know, get rid of that Dell, smash, smash, smash. Well, let's have prisoners do it because we don't care if they get cadmium poisoning. Because where's OSHA? Who knows, right? So we have a real problem, again, with unsafe, exploitative prison labor. State prison labor, same thing. State prisons always continue to have some labor, but not like we have now. <laughs> don't you love this? This is from Pennsylvania. I don't know if you can see this tiny slide, but the, the, the big house, that's the name of the the, the uh, truck that's wheeling out all these goods. Just for kicks, you could go on the website of any state's prison industries and click on it and you would be just amazed what you could get. You know, cleaning supplies and mattresses and you know trophies and ball hats and I mean literally there's probably nothing that you want that you can't find on one of these websites. But of course, that was all work that was done somewhere else, right, on the outside, either by people who had left prison and were doing it or by people who had never gone to prison who were doing it. I want to stop here and people say, well, okay, but, you know, some people want to work in prison. Of course, work is, work can make us feel valuable. We want to work to take care of our children. We would like to be able to work and send money back home to those 10 million children back at home who are somehow affected by the system. There's nothing wrong with work itself. The problem is exploitation. Because nobody's making the money. The people on the inside, the people on the outside, and the net effect is mass employment. I'm sorry, mass unemployment. For the first time since the days of yore, before it was all ended, we get private companies being able to use prison labor too. 
you know, you call Victoria's Secret, you'd like to, you know, get your significant other that sweet little something on Valentine's Day, and you're not, in fact, speaking to some woman with an English accent from, you know, London, you're, in fact, probably talking to a woman who is being paid very, very little in an American correctional facility. At 32 cents, exactly. We also, of course, you know, get this brand new age of prison privatization. And I could do an entire talk on this, but I will just leave it to say that this is really one of the most egregious parts of this story because what it means is, and we haven't again had this since right after the Civil War, where we can absolutely incentivize and make profitable the victimization of other human beings. And I use that term very, very carefully, victimization is of human beings. Because I literally mean that for the people who have been victims of crime, the people who have been victimized by the criminal justice system. In other words, by people without power who have in some ways been victimized. That becomes a money-making en enterprise. And in fact, to put it even more bluntly, that means that if you own one of these prisons and you want to deliver to your stockholders Frankly, it means you have to hope that someone gets victimized tonight. You have to hope that someone gets hurt or that someone gets thrown up on a car door by a police officer for a low level amount of drugs. You have to hope that that happens because if not, then your bed might be empty and you might not have much to deliver to your stockholders. That is an immoral situation. It is an inhumane situation. And by the way, this is the piece of the American puzzle that's getting exported right now uh, globally. Um, this, is the, this is the gateway to taking mass incarceration global. The Pennsylvania story of this, many of you know the Kids for Cash story, a just abominable story of judges being incentivized to send children to uh, private correctional facilities. Uh, but this, of course, is a national problem. The Pennsylvania problem is one that you know about just because the lid was blown off of it. You have no idea, right? None of us have any idea of what this really looks like in communities still across the country. So bottom line, what does this mean? And I'm about ready to wrap this up. It means that when we look around our country today and we see crisis, when we see crisis in the community, when we see too much poverty, when we see catastrophically low high school graduation rates, when we see incidents of police brutality, when we see any of this stuff, what we are seeing is the effects of mass incarceration. And when we look in our communities and we look at the economy of our communities and we say, where did the jobs go? What happened? By the way, it doesn't have to be that all jobs go into prison. The very fact that prison labor is a possibility drives down wages. It makes it harder for union people in a job to say, no, we demand $10 an hour. We demand $15. Well, you know, demand all you like, but I'm going to go to South Carolina and open up my shop in that prison because they're going to give me basically free space and a compliant workforce and sorry. So this is a story that in impacts upon every other story that we care about, but we haven't seen it through that lens. And to start getting our communities and our fellow Americans to see it through that lens might help. I want to say one more thing about that and then I'll move on, which is that we have now been absolutely uh, you know, mesmerized by the television every night by the amount of protests that have been happening in our communities in New York and Philadelphia and Minneapolis last night, Baltimore, everywhere, uh, standing up against police violence. One of the things that has not happened, however, is connecting this conversation about police violence to the conversation about mass incarceration sufficiently. I mean, some of the people in Baltimore, when they were asked what's going on, that's exactly what they said, but I'm talking about the media is not connecting these dots. Let's be clear, the reason why Eric Garner is dead is because he was being low-level harassed, policed. This low-level criminalization of space that I was talking about. If you think about the Eric Garner video and you listen really carefully before he gets to the, the horrific part where he says, I can't breathe, do you hear what he's saying? He says, why are you guys always harassing me? Why are you guys, stop harassing me? Why are you always harassing me? And that harassment ends up in murder. The guy in South Carolina, harassment, a traffic stop, ends up in murder, right? Freddie Gray, harassment ends up in murder. It's this absolute acceptance of low-level policing, which, is, which, is de which the carceral state depends upon. The truth of the matter is that the police need to be brought into this discussion because the truth of the matter is this is a ridiculous situation for police and citizens alike. 
Low level policing isn't good for anybody. Broken windows policing isn't good for anybody. And remarkably, local police departments, believe it or not, have started to have these conversations. Prosecutors have started to have these conversations. So there is a little bit of an interesting light at this end of this tunnel, but it gets to my point, we all have to figure out why this doesn't work for the broader society. So why haven't we changed this? This is where I wanna leave it really quickly. We haven't changed this, why not? If everything I say is true, and you'll have to just trust me for a moment that it is, um, if everything I say is true, then why haven't we ended it? Well, here is the dirty secret. This system, and this is really kind of just extraordinary. This system has built within it its own means of sustaining, its own self-protections. And I just want to talk about that a minute. Structurally, because mass incarceration doesn't just destroy our communities and doesn't just take away economic opportunity and destroy people's economic livelihood, but well, meanwhile, by making millions of dollars for other people, uh, Mass incarceration has literally distorted our democracy. It has made it almost impossible, not impossible, but almost impossible for the people most affected by this to do what they are told they need to do to change it, which is to go in the system and change. You don't like it? Vote against it. You don't like it? Vote for somebody else. You don't like it? Write to your congressperson, right? But the fact of the matter is, we have another 19th century equivalent here. After the Civil War, we criminalized black spaces, we locked everybody up, we put them to work, and then we took away their right to vote. And that was not coincidental, it was absolutely deliberate, it is one of the reasons why we have Jim Crow segregation in the South for the next 100 years, that's how effective it was. And exactly the same thing happens after the civil rights 60s. We criminalize black spaces, we lock everybody up in record numbers, we put them to work, and then we take away their right to vote. This very important case in 1974 said it was perfectly okay. The Supreme Court says it's groovy, you can do this, it's legal. Through a very tortured reading of the Constitution, and by 2006, 48 states had some form of felon disfranchisement on the books. Did this matter? Well, <laughs> yes it did. And again, there are certain people that have spent a lot of time looking at this data, but one of the things that's very clear is that disfranchisement policies affected the outcome of seven U.S. Senate races from 1970 to 1998. And in each case, the Democratic candidate would have won rather than the Republican victor. Not only that, but these outcomes prevented Democratic control of the Senate from 1986 to 2000. And indeed, excluding Americans with criminal records from the democratic process seems to have provided, and this is a quote from Chris Uggins, a small but clear advantage to Republican candidates in every presidential and senatorial election from 1972 to 2000. Pew! Now, I don't want you to get too excited because if the, if the Republicans would have lost and the Democrats would have won, things would have been different. That's not the point. The point is that this distorted our democracy, and it meant that people who had a tough on crime, because eventually it was, absolutely bipartisan, right? Are making it impossible for people who might have voted differently from voting. But that's not it. The worst part is the US Census. Because it isn't just taking people's right to vote away. It is actually using bodies of the imprisoned to empower people who are outside of prison. But let's be clear, it's using black and brown bodies from cities like Philadelphia in all white communities outside of Philadelphia for political power. Those people can't vote in prison, but their bodies count for census population in those communities. So we are another 19th century corollary here, which is the three-fifths clause in the state of Pennsylvania, and this is uh, what I'll leave you with. Eight state legislative districts would not exist, simply would not exist. They would violate the federal one person one vote rule were it not for the use of prisoner bodies. So we should care about this if we care about our democracy, even if we don't care about the carceral state. Because of course census population doesn't just translate into votes, it also translates into early childhood nutrition programs, right? It, it translates into everything, it translates into real dollars. So what about all of us who can, people who can vote, people who are, able to raise their voice. Well, the, the sad part is that many of us don't do anything about it 
because we secretly think that maybe mass incarceration work. Ooh, it's kind of ugly. Ooh, but you know, things are safer now. Have you read the news? You know, crime rates down. Let me tell you something. I spent the last two years on a National Academy study panel, Causes and Consequences of Incarceration. We looked at every bit of data there is out there. And here is the fact. The incarceration rate has gone like this over the last 40 years. The crime rate has gone like this. They are disaggregated. They are not related, and in fact, the incarceration rates that are high have made communities less safe, not more safe. Because the places where incarceration has concentrated has created violence. What a surprise. Just everyone watch Boardwalk Empire? <laughs> Just like after Prohibition, during Prohibition, right? So we got to get it straight. Incarceration does not make communities safer. It makes them less safe. It destroys communities. It destroys the economy. It distorts our democracy. And if we can all figure out ways to understand that, we can all bring in all communities into this discussion about how to end it. Thank you. Wow. Can I take three questions yeah. again? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. We are going to have questions and comments for about a half hour. If you were here this morning, you saw how I run the show. Um, <laughs> we want to hear from like three or four people at a time from the audience so we can have as many people talk as possible. And then I'll throw it back to Heather to answer some of those questions, then back to you all. Um, try and keep it brief so we can hear from as many people in the room as possible. And um, with that, let me get to the first question. I'll also restate the questions so people can hear them. Okay, so that was talk about the organization of the police, the history of that, and how they were used to protect capital, and now let's see where we've gone from there. And also, how does parole and probation affect recidivism? Um, so let's hear from the two people in back. Speak up. Okay, so that comment was um, the, the rebellions, the riots in Baltimore are um, an effect of incarceration as well. Go ahead and back. Okay, the role of privatization in prisons. Maybe so I'll just we'll quickly take these in reverse order. Um, so privatization is huge. I don't want to um, overestimate it as the thing that just alone needs to be tackled. I think there's kind of a sexiness about talking about privatization in prisons that I think kind of sometimes takes attention away from things that the state is very much involved in and, and nonprofits are involved in too. But it is true that uh, privatized uh, not just prisons, but the people who service prisons, right? It's everything from tampons to tasers to telephones, anything that services the, the, the carceral state, 
There's now a profit motive attached to it. Um, but let's be clear, like anything else politically, that didn't just happen. It happened with very, very hard, hard work on the part of the American Legislative Exchange Council. Very painstakingly written uh, pieces of legislation for people to take to the floor and pass. Many, many dollars placed in Congress people's hands to lobby and legislate on various interests. So um, yes, it's very important. It is immoral and unjust and absolutely unethical that we now have a profit motive attached to human misery. But it is also true that those very same laws that were created could be uncreated because like I said, this is a choice. It is not an inevitability. The question about Baltimore is a really powerful one. And um, in fact, I, I was doing a lot of pieces on this this week because everyone sort of says, well, but wait a minute, it's kind of like the 60s, you know, these riots, they're destructive because on the one hand, they're symptomatic of police brutality. And on the other hand, you know, people are shooting themselves in the face. This is their own community and we've just lost all these dollars. Look, I mean, this is a really complicated question, but, but at bottom we have to remember a few things. For most people living in this community, they are far worse now because of mass incarceration than they were in the 60s, and it was damn bad then with police brutality. So it is still a problem that if people were really interested in fixing, they could have fixed it. The fact that people rebel, the fact that people finally lose it is not out of nowhere. It's actually not even that people were just sitting home watching Dr. Phil. The fact is people were trying everything they could to work through the system. The city of Baltimore paid out $5.7 million in police brutality cases last year or whatever it was. And that means that this is, people did try. They tried through the legal system. They tried through, they tried through writing their congressperson. They tried filing complaints. They tried everything they could. So when people's rage finally erupted, how do we understand that it was then directed at, for example, the CVS or the local bodega? Because the fact of the matter is people feel under siege in their own communities, even by the businesses that are there. They don't feel that the CVS that is charging $2 more a pack for Pampers there than is charging in the Target in the suburbs is in their interests. They don't feel like the slum landlord in the house that they just lit a fire is their house. It's a place that they're being charged exorbitant rents for that leak like a sieve in the winter. So in fact, it's a very rational response to desperation and fury. And here's the real dirty secret. That kind of rebellion, yes, it takes money out of the community. But in the 1960s, it wasn't until America blew up from, from coast to coast that the federal government took notice and actually formed the Kerner Commission, right? So we are now talking about Baltimore. We could have been talking about Baltimore three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, you hate to see the devastation, but on the other hand, it's not, you know, those people aren't gonna be a whole lot more devastated tomorrow than they were yesterday. CVS is gonna be more devastated. They can handle it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Police, um, I mean, that's a huge question. Yes, the police have always been placed in a position of protecting property and power and the status quo. The history of that is clear. But it's also true that the police are public citizens. And depending on what moment in American history you look at, police have more or less power and can be placed more or less in check. So while it is true that I don't believe that the police are this ultimately reformable institution, it is absolutely the case that police cannot always and have not always been able to run just as their own vigilante uh, army. Um, for example, after the rebellion in Detroit in 1967, very, very notably, we got some pretty serious checks on police practices in Detroit. We got a residency requirement, for example. Police had to live in the community that they policed. Um, we got, a, you know, with civilian review boards. I mean, many of the reforms we got in Miranda rights, all that stuff came about because people tried to put uh, public checks on the public service institution, which was the police. But yes, you're right. Uh, the police at the end of the day have always been primarily there to protect the status quo, which is about power and capital and, and the people with power. It's, look, no one should be surprised. <laughs> it's like with Baltimore, we, what, what, are we surprised? Not, not if anyone's being honest, nor should we be surprised that parole is a colossal failure, probation is a colossal failure, because it's meant to be. 
Because the fact of the matter is, if we were serious about returning people to the community, if we were, seri if we were serious about people's citizenship, we would not have 48 out of 50 states with felon disfranchisement laws. We would not have the box. We would not have parole officers being informed that if someone doesn't even have their cell phone turned on, that could be a violation. Or that if they're hanging around with someone who happens to have you know, a fifth of whiskey, that could be a parole violation. I mean, we have created the system to fail. But again, that ties back to the privatization issue. There's a whole lot of people that work really hard to make sure we don't reform those laws, to make sure we don't reform the drug laws, to make sure we don't make parole more fair, to make sure we don't, and I don't mean this is a conspiracy. I mean, this is literally you go and you figure out who was passing which law, which city ordinance, and so forth. Now, I will say that on the ground, the social workers and the parole officers and the folks trying to do that work, I mean, it looks really differently to them. They feel, un they feel starved, they feel like they have no resources, they feel like they're doomed to fail because they're not really being uh, given resources, and that's true too. Go ahead, Emory. Okay, um, looking at the role that Alec has played over the long span, and maybe you can explain a little bit more about who Alec is, but I know in Pennsylvania that organization worked behind the scenes without the public having any awareness for probably, what, 30 years mm -hmm. to orchestrate policies which in, in fact brought great damage to public safety. So understanding where Alec has created this, do you see any kind of um, ways for people to come together to reverse these policies? I mean, what is that coalition? That's okay. question number one. And connected with that, since I'm from Art for Justice, how can people in your you know, really global understanding of the situation who are living these experiences of being incarcerated participate in the solutions? Mm -hmm. How can their voices, I bring you the art, mm -hmm. and I bring it because I am not part of the prison system, I am a private citizen with the right to free speech, but what else can you see in, in your great understanding that they could do? Because so a lot in the prison if they could come to this. How can we roll back some of the, the force of ALEC um, privatization, um, the horrible laws they've put into place? What would a coalition look like for that? And then how are people in prison a part of the solution, um, raising their voices, working with them inside? Go ahead. Okay, so that was, what is the prediction for these kids whose parents are incarcerated? What are their futures going to look like? Um, go ahead in front. Can you comment on the role of white people in creating the system of mass incarceration and on our responsibility for ending it? Okay. Okay, the role of white people in creating and hopefully ending mass incarceration. These are three. I'm, I'm actually very grateful for all these questions because they, they remind me of things that were in my 20 pages I never looked at that I wanted to say and didn't. Um, starting first with you, Emory. Look, the, the fact of the matter is that ALEC, for those of you who don't know, it's actually just a coalition of business people who got together and decided that they needed certain things accomplished legally, and they put their money there, and they put Congress people on alert that they wanted their interests represented in Congress. The reason why that is so important is because it reminds me of something that was said earlier this morning. Someone expressed enormous frustration, rightfully so, that it seems like no matter, even if we fight this stuff, it comes back. Even if we fight this stuff, it comes back. Let's be clear, the, the history of this country is always contested. It's always about fighting back from people who would be against the interests of the broader body public, right? So yes, one of the reasons why ALEC is able to make the headway that it's able to make is frankly because a lot of people who felt very victorious about a lot of the successes they had in the 1960s just went, whoa, 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 glad we got that accomplished, and simply weren't, well, they just weren't paying attention. They simply were not paying attention. So when Alec is passing all these laws, for example, the ability to use prison labor again, the labor movement is nowhere, right? The AFL-CIO is completely asleep at the wheel. So the fact of the matter is, one of the reasons why we keep getting back here is because the people that are fighting the good fight 
keep going, whew, God, why we got that done? <laughs> Businesses never go to sleep. Corporations never go to sleep. People who want to, to, to serve their own interests never go to sleep. So I think the real message from that is how do we all kind of stay awake generationally, not just stay awake in the moment. Um, remind me. Is the, People in prison. People in prison. So, so the other thing, back to this coalition building. Let's be clear, in every moment in American history when we have beaten back upticks in the carceral crisis, it has been because incarcerated folks themselves have been at the front of it. This is not just some pie in the sky politically correct, oh, let's make sure formerly incarcerated. No, this is a historical fact. One of the reasons why convict leasing ends in the South is because it is literally the case that the formerly incarcerated there and the incarcerated there were bringing massive attention to it. I mean, some, sometimes in horrific ways, like slitting their own heel tendons so that they couldn't work to show how brutal this was. Some of it was in for, for, for terms of uh, hunger strike. Some of it was in terms of going to the media. There's a million ways in which it was the incarcerated themselves that made it clear how bad the system was. I'm working on a book on the Attica prison uprising. I've spent 10 years doing it. I mean, front and center, the Attica brothers understood what was going to happen in this country if the carceral state was left unchecked. That's what they were trying to stay. That's what they were trying to do. And in fact, did it work? You know, following Attica, there was a huge uptick of prison justice reform. It actually mattered. It actually did make a difference. And then people, you know, yeah, glad we got that accomplished. Glad there's $10 million in the prison reform budget. And then boom, right? We get all the Rockefeller drug laws. So historically, this coalition can't exist without prisoners being at the forefront of it, without you know, returning citizens being at the forefront of it. And again, it's already happening, right? I mean, whether we're in Georgia or Pelican Bay or here in Philadelphia, it doesn't matter, right? People are already speaking out. And they have to, because that's the only way it's ever changed. Um, <sighs> the question I'm remembering, you know, so what's the prognosis for these generations of children? Look, um, there's a whole lot of optimism in Washington right now. I just attended this bipartisan summit on criminal justice reform and, you know, had this most surreal experience of my life speaking in the same room with Newt Gingrich and Cory Booker and the Koch brothers. I mean, I was like, I, I needed to be on drugs after that uh, weekend. <laughs> but, but, but here was the thing about that, right? I think there's a whole, it's a, a whole lot of people are talking about decarceration right now. A whole lot of people are talking about the crisis of the criminal justice system. And that itself is an amazing, wonderful, beautiful thing. In fact, I almost was brought to tears when I saw this gathering because I thought, God, this couldn't even have happened five years ago. I mean, we were speaking, all of us doing this work, right? We were speaking Greek five years ago to people about this. So on the one hand, the prognosis seems good. On the other hand, to really fix this, is gonna take a commitment to human beings and a commitment to children and a commitment to, to, to community that I worry isn't there. So those children, this is, this is scarring of, this is a scarring, it's a post-traumatic stress, it is a, it is a catastrophe that if we are really serious, we gotta start, again, we can't fall asleep at the wheel if we succeed in decarceration. We can't fall asleep at the wheel if we get rid of the war on drugs. We can't fall asleep at the wheel if all of a sudden the prison population of Philadelphia goes down by 50%. Because the real work is gonna be to take those dollars, those resources, and put them back into our communities and help those kids. And there's nobody gonna be advocating for it if it's not the teachers and the parents and those kids themselves, right? So I, I'm not optimistic, but history shows us I can be, you know, if we, if we do that. And the final comment about white people. Look, um, <laughs> whoa, where to begin about white people? <laughs> um, I often think about the 1960s and Stokely Carmichael, then Kwame Ture, had really one of the most profound contributions to what pipe, white people needed to be doing, which was, how about getting in your own communities and starting to work? <laughs> now, look, I mean, it's a little, it's a, it's a flip statement, but the fact of the matter is, it is a lot harder for everyone in this room with white skin to go home at Thanksgiving and talk to your own families about this than it is to be here today. It is a lot harder to go to your own schools, your own workplaces, your own parks, your, your own social gatherings, and start talking about this. So in that sense, whites have, in some respect, the most responsibility for this because they created this mess. 
and they own it and they profit from it and they benefit from it and their very ability to have the good jobs and their ability to live in the nice neighborhoods. Everything that they have depends upon this oppression. Well, see, I don't say they, I, I never say they for whites or blacks because to me it's about, it's about they, the people who are creating the problem and they who are creating, and us who are creating the solution. So <laughs> I would like to include all of us in here in the solution, but you're right. We, all of us, me, you, anyone in here who benefits from this has the biggest responsibility to speaking out for it. And so yes, it's going to be those people inside who lead it, but if white folks are not willing to go home to their own Thanksgiving table and say, you know what, no. Or how about just how many of you have been sitting around with family members and watching the news on Baltimore? You know, how hard is it to talk to your own community? my own community, your own community. How hard is it to talk about what really, and so that's where the hard work is. Being allies is the hard work, but it's also important to say it's being an ally. It's not being a leader of this. You can create a mess and not, lead, and not necessarily lead the solution to it. In fact, you probably can't lead the solution to it because you're too deeply invested in it. You're too culpable in it. So all you can do is say, I'll sit aside, you lead it, but I'm sure as hell gonna be clear how I benefit from it, how you benefit from it, and how the people around me benefit from it. I think that's really crucial. Um, I think, can I ask a question just to push back on that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because I think we haven't yet talked about how white people have been duped by racism okay. from the beginning of, of, of the country. Thank you. And so if you can talk a little bit about Again, what, what white people have, to, what vast majority of poor and working white people have to yeah. gain from defeating racism that, you know, the uber elite trickle down to yeah. some, you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, yes, all white people are not the same. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean that all white people are not the same in terms of having white privilege, because I think that if you have white skin in this country, I don't care how poor you are, you have white privilege. But it is also true that white people are not all the same, which is to say that they don't have the same benefit from the oppressive system that other white people do. And indeed, the, the, the most elite people uh, get their most benefit when poor black folks, brown folks, and white folks don't talk to each other and don't see what they have in common. And the fact of the matter is our prison system, if we had a major watch on, march on Washington of families of the incarcerated tomorrow in DC, it wouldn't be all black and it wouldn't be all brown. There's a whole lot of poor white folks locked up in the system too. So that's important. And it's important that this is about people and it's about working in poor people and it's not just about race. But again, we've seen the data, we've seen the studies. If you were a poor white kid that gets out of prison and you're a poor black kid that gets out of prison, if there is a job, white privilege still matters. And we've got to talk about that. And, um, but, but we also have to talk about the fact that both of those kids should have jobs, right? Uh, go ahead, Father. I uh, sure. really appreciate your passion, your perspective, but also the hard data and the facts to match that passion and perspective. Thank you. I, it seems like I've noticed a huge uptick in criminology programs at an undergraduate and graduate level, and I don't know very much about it, but there's a part of me that is very suspicious and wondering if this is essentially feeding into a system that's already corrupt and oppressive, or whether the some reform, meaningful reform, are being chosen by people who bring matters of conscience and values to the next generation of professionals yeah. who are working in the field. I'd be just interested to hear what you have to say. Okay. Here's your hope. <laughs> um, in New York State, uh, we have a lot of politicians upstate that say out of the New York metropolitan area. Dale Volker, for example. Who owe their, <laughs> their elected positions to the fact that they have yeah. large prison populations in their counties uh, who are counted as part of the local population. Pennsylvania. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, and in my own work as a volunteer, I, you know, I've, done, I've come up against the fact that I'm dealing every time I go in with people who have, uh, who are there because it's a jobs program and it's a career path for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to me to be uh, a real difficulty. Having created this business of prisons 
and created these career tracks yep. and jobs uh, for people who very often wouldn't have another job yep. if they didn't have a So I, I would like you to address that, if you would, as a, as a problem and how we get through that. OK, so those two tie together somewhat, I think. The, the, the boom of sociology programs, um, the <laughs> criminology, excuse me, programs, um, the people that live in these urban, um, commun uh, uh, suburban and rural communities that were built up around prisons and praying that the prisons aren't, aren't closing down because it's their, their careers. Go ahead. I think we need to make the distinction between criminal justice programs and criminology programs. Criminology is much more grounded in sociology. Criminal justice much more tied to Okay, so that was just a comment. The distinction between criminal justice programs, with it, which I think is more practical on the job training for law enforcement, uh, versus um, criminology programs, which is closer to sociology. Uh, how about one more? Go ahead. I keep thinking of analogies to another population uh, subject to social control, and that's the mentally ill. And the <laughs> mentally ill. And looking at the history of um, institutionalization of the mentally ill, when you look back, uh, cost shifting mm -hmm. had a lot to do with, say, deinstitutionalization, shifting the cost to counties mm -hmm. and the federal government. And I was wondering if you saw this happening either within privatization or the potential for it to happen um, as a shift in social control of the incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was about. Um, the overlap of mental health populations, um, cost shifting from uh, federal mental institutions to, to community-based um, institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, first on uh, criminal justice or criminology programs, um, we need to remember that in the 1960s, uh, departments of criminal justice or criminology had incredibly radical components to them. Some of our most incredibly radical and good ideas about deinstitutionalization and deincarceration actually came from those folks in the 60s, people like Tony Platt, and there's just a whole host of, it was a whole genre called radical criminology. I think that's coming back. Uh, I think it's the case that, um, you're right, that criminology is not necessarily the same as criminal justice, but some universities just simply have criminal justice programs, and for years and years they've been the place to train parole officers and police. Um, but I think that, again, our students are really looking for a way to intersect with this issue now from a very progressive point of view. And so we are seeing a, an, in, a, an, in, an uptick in majors in criminal justice now, people who are genuinely interested in fixing this mess. So I, think, I do think that there is a palpable change. But it's always a slippery slope because when you're teaching corrections and you're not teaching you know, a justice history in the same program, you're kind of, you're kind of in trouble. Um, again, speaking of slippery slopes, this question it comes up all the time, and especially because originally by training I'm a labor historian, so I probably get more than my share of these questions about what do we do about the prison guards, for example? What do we do about these prisons? Look, one of the reasons why I think it is so important that we get the labor movement into this discussion is because we have to have a really honest discussion about real job growth and where it's gonna come from. And the fact of the matter is the data is clear on this and when people in prison communities are shown the data, they're quite surprised. Prison, prison economies are very unstable. They are not sustaining, which is to say that just because your father was a prison guard does not mean you're gonna be a prison guard. In fact, likely you will not. With prison privatization, prison guards are getting paid less now than they were 20 years ago. And in fact, the, the whole span of a prison guard is changing due to privatization and due to overcrowding. It's an incredibly unsafe job uh, for, for corrections officers, just like it's unsafe for the incarcerated because these places are, are absolutely pressure cookers because of the way that they're overcrowded and designed. And so this is a working class issue. The carceral state is a working class issue. How is it, it's a working class issue in the sense of how do we employ people who have been in the system? And it's a working class issue in terms of if you work in the system, how can we bring jobs to your community that are not based on human exploitation? And the fact of the matter is when you ask people, would you rather work for RCA or would you rather work for a prison? Most people don't want to work for a prison. In fact, most people don't want to be in that kind of an environment. Um, and, and in fact, it, it's been really interesting studies done of prison guards. You asked, for example, about rehabilitation programs versus retributive programs. Prison guards actually, I mean, there's always the, you know, kind of heinous individuals. But, but overwhelmingly, from a purely job point of view, make your day easier. 
you know, having, having overcrowding is the worst thing you can do. Taking away all programming is the worst thing you can do. Taking college programs out of prison is the worst thing you can do. So there's all kinds of ways in which there are some allies in here that we automatically assume are enemies, but we can't because if they're gonna fight us in the state legislature to keep a prison open, then we gotta have an honest conversation about close the prison, build another factory, build something else. I will tell you, here's the thing though. A lot of guards, for example, asked me has become very progressive on this issue. They have, been, they have absolutely been at the forefront of fighting prison privatization. Asked me, American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees. And here's what they'll tell you. Sometimes our members, this will say, sometimes our members, they fight the closing of a prison and everybody says it's because they want to keep people locked up. The reason that they're fighting the closing of a prison is because they know that they're going to close this facility, but they're not going to decarcerate anybody. And they're going to put all of those people over in this facility. And so not only did people lose their jobs, but the jobs that were over here and the people who were locked up over here, everything just got a whole lot worse and a whole lot less safe. So it's kind of interesting how, I mean, I, I, look, I got no illusions about, you know, I think, <laughs> I think with the police and guards, we got a lot of complicated issues. I'm just simply saying that this is an issue we got to tackle. And I think that the labor movement has a real responsibility to start talking about this issue. Full employment for all Americans that is not based on human misery. Yeah, Exactly. And mm -hmm. deindustrialization, et cetera, et cetera, exactly. in this country. So that has to have, somebody has to decide we're going to stop that drive. But, but they're linked. And so if we're going to have Richard Trumka, the head of the AFL-CIO, say we're going to stop shipping jobs off, out of the country, the same conversation has to be, and we have to start opening jobs here that are not in the prison economy. I'll tell you, though, I mean, I was speaking at the AFL-CIO convention, what was it now, last year, uh, and I mean, Rich Trumpka must have used the phrase mass incarceration in front of delegate, you know, in front of whatever, 30,000 delegates sitting there 10 times. Mm -hmm. And I talked to him off, off site, you know, and I, I said, you know, I really appreciate that you've brought this issue to the membership. And he says, well, it affects me personally. Mm -hmm. And that's not to minimize his commitment to it, it's to say he's being honest. This is, this is a human problem, this is an American problem, this is our problem, and it's a working class problem, including the people upstate. Uh, just last couple questions or comments, go ahead. Hi. Hi. So, um, I'm really interested in organizing uh, in faith communities specifically, mm -hmm. and it strikes me that there's just a knowledge and information gap. Like, all of what you just did in 30 minutes, I'm like, what the hell did my history teacher teach me? <laughs> Are already mind blown that they've been taught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they've been they've been engaging in myth um, believing. Um, how how can we make sort of scholarly scholarly work accessible to people? I'm thinking about you know a people's history of this or that. Is mm -hmm. there something like that that exists um, related to justice history or? or well, that's why Michelle's book was so profound, right? Exactly. Because Michelle's book, that's exactly what it did. That's what I try to do. I mean, I write my scholarly articles to get myself a job, but I also try to write as much as I can for the HuffPost and the Atlantic and any place else I can write so that, that people can just take them into their, I mean, everything I've ever written is on my website and it's free and you download it. And I try to take this talk and I try to make it dispensable. But honestly, I'll tell you, as much as we can package this stuff as academics, the most powerful tool you have to ending mass incarceration is listening to people that have experienced it. For my students, I can blather on day in, day out about all these factoids, but then I can, or I can take them into Greater Fruit, or I can take them, or I can bring, you know, Tyrone Wirt to come and, you know, or whoever, right, to come into to my classroom and talk to people. Um, you know, Temple has an amazing Inside Out program. Michigan has an amazing Prisoner Arts program. It's really important. If, if people on the outside spend three minutes with someone who has actually lived this, this history makes immediate sense. And so what I would encourage the faith-based community to do is what I encourage every teacher to do, every community activist to do, get people who have experienced this just to tell their stories. Because it's all there, it's all there, it's all human, it's all powerful, and it's all so unjust that people can't, 
they can't walk away from that without being touched by it. Um, so yeah, those articles are there if you want them, but at the end of the day, have your, your, you know, the churches need to bring people in who tell about what this really looks like. What does this look like in a community? What does it look like in people's lives? Heather, do you know any good movies that... Um, yes! <laughs> in terms of education. Well, you know what? It's funny. I, this, is joking, this is joking aside. So Matt's movie, Broken on All Sides, I use it all the time. And, and, I, it, and in fact, it's so much a part of what I do that it's like, it's, like the, it's like the furniture I just sit on, right? I never even thought about it. Yes, the, the power of documentary film is incredibly important. And again, I can blather all day to my students or I can bring people in to talk about their experience or show Matt's film. And you know, there's a lot of, there's another film, I don't know if you've ever seen this one, Juvies, the, it's all about children serving life without parole. And um, it's just one of those documentaries like Matt's where the students just, they can't, they just kind of sit there and they, and they can't even kind of move. But, but why is because it makes this real. It's not theoretical. It's not a graph. And yes, Matt's film, for sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me here.